Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, uh, Mr. Lucas and uh, uh, Michael, who is here, <clears throat> for inviting me uh, again this year to talk about the Israeli medical cannabis program and about some other issues related to medical cannabis. Um, first, I'll give you a, an overview of the Israeli medical cannabis uh, program, and then we move into uh, other issues. Uh, so as you can see, Israel is a very small country. It looks like, uh, like a small lake in uh, Minnesota, you know, on the bottom there. Uh, Eight million people, very close to the number here in the Czech Republic. Uh, very educated population, relatively. Uh, it's called Research Nation. And uh, THC was uh, first isolated in Israel in 1966 by Mishulam and colleagues, and uh, Professor uh, Lumi Hanish, uh, Hanush, uh, who we are honored to have here in the crowd. Please uh, raise your hand uh, over here. Uh, and colleagues who identified the anandamide in 1992, uh, and the very important discovery of the indigenous cannabinoid uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, he is uh, a native uh, Czech uh, here and uh, still works uh, over here, so uh, we know him and uh, respect him a great deal. Um, some of you may know this flower. Um, this is a, a picture taken from uh, uh, Kandok. Uh, there are eight growers in Israel. Uh, it is basically started as an activist effort. Uh, and now there are 13,000 patients served by eight growing groups. Uh, Israel is the third country in the world uh, to have a national medical cannabis uh, uh, program or agency after Holland and Canada. <coughs> and we really hope uh, uh, that uh, in the Czech Republic would be the fourth country uh, to launch a compassionate and just medical cannabis program. Uh, and uh, so uh, the Czech Republic is not the first and uh, there's nothing, there's no need to invent the wheel every time. There are rules and regulations, and we'll talk about them later, that can be followed uh, and to be part of uh, UN drug conventions. Uh, the Dutch were the first uh, to establish such an agency uh, that uh, according to UN drug convention is required. This is a brief history of uh, the program in Israel. <clears throat> in 1991, uh, the gentleman on the uh, left is uh, Professor Meshulam. Uh, I was a, a public representative in the uh, subcommittee discussion on the legal status of cannabis, and it had two, uh, the, uh, two rulings or two uh, conclusions. One, not to change the legal status of cannabis. The second was to allow uh, medical cannabis uh, access. And uh, in 1990, uh, you see me uh, when I was much younger, thrown out of the parliament for uh, disapproving the first uh, conclusion. And I thought that cannabis should be decriminalized as well, not just uh, to uh, allow access to medical cannabis. So basically, uh, I was uh, thrown out uh, after uh, arguing with the chairman. <laughs> and then uh, in '96, I approached the Ministry of Health with a drug master file. Uh, and uh, what's this? A drug master file and a patient requesting to imp implement the, com uh, the uh, recommendation of that committee. A uh, few patients, uh, 96 to 99, were approved. It was a very slow process. Then in uh, 99, they had a committee uh, established. Uh, it was really uh, dragging their uh, feet. Uh, in '99, that was the year also I established a political party in Israel. It's very easy to start, start political parties in Israel uh, and run for the parliament. It was called the Greenleaf Party for Cannabis Legalization. And on our agenda, of course, was medical cannabis. And we had meetings and dialogue with the Ministry of Health throughout 2004 uh, and, and so on. By 2004, there were 60 applicants. And the breakthrough came around 2005 when, uh, when a new uh, director general uh, by the name of Yuda Baruch was a, uh, approved, uh, as it was uh, nominated to run the program. In 2007, 
first licenses for three growers and uh, two years they asked for free distribution. <clears throat> of course, free distribution is a non-sustainable uh, economic model, uh, but the government said uh, we want to see that these are sincere people, so uh, the growers had to give away free cannabis for a while, which was really uh, put them in a uh, financial hole. It was very difficult to get out of that. And um, in 2009, uh, they uh, opened a distribution center uh, and in 2013 uh, uh, based on a cabinet, government cabinet uh, uh, decision uh, the medical cannabis agency was established. That is a graph of the uh, rise of number of patients over there. <clears throat> it's going up and uh, I uh, quoted uh, Yuda Baruch uh, who is the head of the program, is a psychiatrist, and he says that a lot of patients benefit greatly from the uh, use of medical cannabis. It's another medicine in the pharmacopoeia. It's higher safety than opiates. We'll get into opiates later and how it relates to cannabis. Uh, no death from an overdose. On the downside, there's, may, uh, there's pressure on doctors to uh, give prescription to uh, medical cannabis. Uh, especially in pain clinics. <clears throat> From a patient's uh, perspective, cannabis is better tolerate, uh, t tolerated than opiates. Uh, there's no risk of overdose, a different mechanism of action, a different uh, type of its, uh, receptors, and can help where other medications don't help. Uh, it's a social trend. I don't buy it. It's a social trend. It's, a tr uh, it's here to stay. Medical cannabis, it's been used for 5,000 5, years since the early Chinese, uh, you know, emperors or whatever the name, I forgot of that Chinese emperor. And it's been dogmatized, uh, I mean, it's been illegal for a while and now it's back in the spotlight and it's here to stay. They won't be able to, uh, to deny the medical benefits of cannabis anymore. So uh, other issues is uh, what kind of strains to use, who decides, should self-growing be allowed. We tried self-growing by patients, and patients, it doesn't work. Uh, patients are usually sick people, they are not gardeners, uh, they have to go to the hospital. Uh, it is the responsibility of the, of the government to find a solution for the supply for patients. They can't put it on the back of the, of the patients. These are the indications that uh, are now being used in Israel. Uh, unfortunately, medical cannabis is a last resort treatment meaning first you have to try all the other medications if they fail then you can apply to medical cannabis in my view it should be a first uh, option uh, because if opiates is an elephant then cannabis is like a rabbit okay so uh, first try the opiates if, uh, first try the cannabis if it doesn't do it, if it doesn't help then go uh, on a step on the ladder to higher and more uh, severe side effect medications so we feel, we see that chronic pain is, uh, is the number one issue. We have a, a track for often, the often diseases. These are cases that are not part of the most common uh, indications. HIV patients, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson disease, uh, malignant tumor in various stages of disease, and other conditions under the exceptional clause. Um, this is a slide from 2011. Uh, so we can see that pain is the number one indication. Cancer is second, multiple sclerosis. Pain and cancer probably cover 80% of, uh, of the patients. ALS, if you look at the bottom, also uh, PTSD. We will show you a result of a post-traumatic stress syndrome study that was done in Israel with tremendous results. Tremendous ex-war veterans chronic with, with chronic PTSD who were instructed to smoke it and, and their lives were uh, absolutely changed. This is a very famous slide by uh, uh, Professor Mishulam uh, and you can talk about the different cannabinoids and, uh, and some acids here and uh, as you can see CBD uh, has more, uh, 
more therapeutic uses than uh, even THC, of course, than in other types of uh, cannabinoids. And the trend that initially started to, uh, by growers, by commercial growers, to have high THC, low CBD, is now shifting. Uh, and, the, uh, and the shift emphasizes high CBD and low THC, and in some cases, very high CBD, and that it actually qualifies as, as hemp, meaning less than 0.2 or 0.3 percent of uh, THC. Uh, because uh, the uh, uh, psychoactivity is not always desired by patients. In Israel, the average age of patient is like 50, the average age, whereas in California it's maybe 25. So meaning in Israel, most patients never smoke cannabis in their lives. And if you give them high THC to begin with, uh, it's, it's, not as, it's not easy for them. So you have to start from less psychoactive, and if it doesn't help, you go up into higher strains. <clears throat> this is the, uh, from 2004 to 2011, that was the flow chart of uh, how it happened. There were, uh, let's start from the top, patients needed a, a specialist doctor, uh, and then there were only seven doctors. Initially there was one doctor in the country who gave licenses for patients, okay? And then it went to growers, and then to central distribution, and there were options for home delivery. Uh, today, the <clears throat> flowchart looks like this. Uh, this is the model, by the way, that is approved or uh, consistent with uh, UN drug conventions. And this is the model that eventually will happen here. And uh, <clears throat> so patients with permit uh, eventually would get it from pharmacies, the number of growers, uh, uh, all produced cannabis is bought by, by a government agency, in Israel it's called Sarael, it's a, monolistic, uh, a monopolistic government agency, and they pack it and they sell it through pharmacies. This is the model that happened in, in, uh, in Holland, this is the model that, uh, that is in Canada, and this is the model that is happening in Israel. The only difference is that uh, in Israel, uh, we'll talk about what is the difference. After the establishment of the National Medical Cannabis Agency, Sarel is the monopolistic arm of the agency. Uh, it will buy the crop through tender. It, it has to make a tender, a public tender, like is planned here, to choose growers, uh, distribute through pharmacies, uh, license to handle controlled substances, option for home delivery, that's in Israel. It doesn't happen, I don't know if it happens in Canada or in Holland. You did, does it? Uh, anybody know if uh, home delivery uh, happens? Uh, no? No? Okay. Option for trial and error. In Israel, they allow for trial and error to try different strains. We will talk about how important it is to offer patients a number, a large variety of strains and options of, of consumption, delivery options. And. Um, this is the first legal uh, grow operation. As you can see, it looks like uh, uh, very amateurish. Um, this is a guy and his mother. They, uh, they grew it on the roof in northern Israel. Uh, and this is how uh, it looks uh, more or less today. Uh, this is a courtesy of uh, Kandok in Israel, uh, which is number one, basically, I think, uh, company in Israel today. Uh, as you can see, uh, consistency, you can see st stability and uh, sophistication in the growing. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, some varieties and uh, at one time were uh, grown in the desert. So uh, we experiment with different varieties. Uh, it's not a good idea to grow cannabis in the desert because the desert has extreme conditions, <clears throat> hot and cold. Sometimes you have sandstorms, so it's better to grow cannabis uh, in a moderate weather uh, type of uh, environment. Uh, these are the consum <coughs> consumption options for patients. Just a second, I have to take some water here. Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, 
Okay, so you had time to read through it and see the slide. You can see a uh, different variety, the flowers, the oil, the, uh, they banned, they stopped selling, allowing uh, the sale of the brownies or, or cookies or with a very strange uh, uh, excuse, the government said or the agency said that uh, you cannot produce food with consistent quantities every time. I don't buy it. I don't know why they said it. Uh, you can see uh, 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 some type of uh, oil or ointment, uh, joints and vaporizer. In some hospitals in Israel, in oncology departments, cancer patients can use vaporizers. They lie in bed, okay, and they, uh, they're given the vaporizer if they have licenses, so they don't have to go outside of the hospital and to hide in the shed or something to smoke the, uh, to smoke the joints. A real difference, I think, uh, between the Israeli medical cannabis and other uh, national Dutch and Canadian is the education part. And I have to emphasize here to the uh, audience here in the Czech Republic, whoever, or from other countries, uh, who, is, who is from the Czech Republic here? I'm sorry, I, what can I ask? Okay. Okay, so it's a mostly a... Uh, uh, a Czech audience, so uh, please do not forget uh, patient education. Most patients don't know what cannabis is. They think that, that once they smoke cannabis, they'll see flying elephants in the room. You have to tell them uh, that it's, in most cases, it's like drinking like two uh, uh, wine uh, uh, shots or uh, some, uh, some alcohol uh, in terms of the little uh, euphoria. So it's a cornerstone of successful medical cannabis program. Personal interviews, take home media kit with frequently, frequently asked questions. You have to establish hotline for patient questions. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I, 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 there are insecure people who are sick and they need uh, uh, an ear, yes, to answer the questions. You have to educate the physicians and nurses. There's, uh, great deal of ignorance in the medical community about cannabis. The curriculum is not incorporated in, uh, in medical schools. You have to build curriculum. There's now an international effort that we are trying to also do help is to build this curriculum uh, and integrate it into medical uh, for physicians and nurses. Uh, you have to organize conferences. You have to make it part of continuing education credit for the, uh, for the medical, uh, medical stuff. You have to bring into the loop the politicians. The politicians are the troublemakers usually, okay? There's resistance from two sources. There's the politicians and there's the conservatives uh, in the medical establishment that they do what they are taught to do, okay? Is to give opiates, and to give all these hardcore medications with tremendous side effects and cannabis for them is uh, toxic or I don't know what because they've been brainwashed by government propaganda for many years about cannabis okay because it's an outlawed drug so uh, you have to be nice to the politicians invite them into the loop and share the information with them. Luckily, we have the internet today, so the government doesn't, does not uh, uh, have monopoly on information anymore. So if someone wants to learn about cannabis, medical cannabis, <coughs> they can do so. <coughs> so this is a, uh, another, uh, uh, so the Israeli medical cannabis program uh, has gained in reputation because of its professionalism and the care that it would not be abused. This is another picture from uh, uh, that company, Kandok. Uh, and this is Herbal Gram. Herbal Gram is the American Botanical uh, Association uh, magazine. And if you can see here, this the underlined. For the first time, they put cannabis uh, in the front cover. And uh, the American Herbal Pharmacopeia is developing the standards monograph and therapeutic compendium the first of its kind in North America, and the American Herbal Products Association of Cannabis Committee just released a draft recommendation 
for regulators on the legal dispensation of medical cannabis. So you can use that uh, in America. So uh, when a patient comes to Israel, uh, you make an interview. I think this is something that needs to be done here and everywhere, also uh, uh, in other countries. Uh, I hear that there are maybe Portugal will be after the Czech Republic and so forth. You have to ask them, what are you suffering from, how bad it is, how long, what kind of medications you are taking. What we see here in Israel, for example, that people who are very, very sick, who take five or six or seven medications, once you get them on medical cannabis, they go down to two medications or one medication. So what you'll see here is an opposition by the pharmaceutical industry that is making money from these patients and for them, cannabis is a threat for their profits, okay? So, and it's happening. Uh, have you smoked cigarettes and so on? Uh, you have to explain him what are the possible side effects. There are side effects sometimes. Uh, cannabis doesn't work for everybody. It works maybe 70, 80% of the, of the people it works for. Whoever suffers from severe side effects from cannabis should stop it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't help. It's especially good in ger geriatrics, by the way. Many people who suffer from, I think, uh, maybe cannabinoid deficiency syndrome, I call it, which is, this have to be expanded by uh, researchers, exactly how you measure that deficiency. When you introduce cannabinoids into the system, suddenly there's a whole set of activity that uh, does wonders uh, for these people. This is the PTSD. How much time do I have, by the way? Uh, I have time, right? Okay. This is the uh, story of a small pilot study on PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome patients, war veterans from the 1973 war. Okay, so we're talking 40-year-old, I mean, I mean veterans who suffered from chronic PTSD for 40 years. So the truth of the matter is the modern pharmacopoeia cannot help these people. They give them anti-psychotic uh, medications, they give them uh, uh, SRIs, they give them anti-epileptic medications, they, and nothing works. So in this study, they took 30, uh, 29 subjects they gave them uh, to smoke cannabis, 23% uh, THC, with, with little CBD, <clears throat> 100 grams per month, which is a lot of cannabis. The average consumer of medical cannabis in Israel smokes maybe 27, 30 grams, one gram a day, okay? And it was added to their standing treatment Subjected to, uh, uh, subjects were instructed to smoke the cannabis daily at times, uh, frequency and amounts on their own choosing. <clears throat> Smoking cannabis, from a government point of view, is the least preferred option. But from a patient point of view, if you see uh, in many countries, the patients prefer the smoking over the oil and over the other options. And the reason is <clears throat> that they can titrate they uh, themselves much better through the lungs and through an immediate uh, uh, entry of the cannabis into the bloodstream whereas if you eat it or you take it in drops it takes much longer to make an influence and it lasts much longer so if the smoke affects uh, are over after two, three hours, if you swallow cannabis, if you digest it, it lasts much longer and usually it has higher psychoactivity if you take the same amount of cannabis th uh, uh, through uh, digestion rather than smoking. <clears throat> and these are the results. After cannabis treatment, a significant decrease in total CAPS is the uh, score of uh, PTSD. And in three subsections of the test was seen, specifically the severity of intrusion, intrusive symptoms, which are most char characteristic of PTSD, dropped by half within two months of treatment. The severity of avoidance symptom, avoidance is like they hear a noise and they try to avoid it, 
it dropped by 38% two months of treatment. Uh, severity of the increased arousal symptoms dropped by 43% within two months of treatment. Also, there was significant improvement in self-reported emotional distress and functional functionality with the family. Uh, a marked improvement in the assessment of subjects uh, in the uh, DSM-4. Uh, Specifically, an improvement 45% was seen in the general evaluation of subjects' psychological state after two months of treatment. Tremendous results. This is a groundbreaking uh, study that was done in Israel. They need to expand it. The United States have a quarter of a million of war veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq. And the federal government, the US federal government, is blocking medical cannabis research. And there are many PTSD patients who are from the NATO forces. I'm sure here in the Czech Republic as well, because you're part of NATO. And you should let the Ministry of uh, 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 Defense and the Ministry of Health know about this study. Uh, so is the Israeli medical pr program uh, good, uh, bad, or uh, perfect? Uh, well, it's uh, neither, neither, neither one. It needs improvement. For example, uh, in my eyes, or in my view, every doctor should be allowed to give a prescription to medical cannabis, and not just few specialists, because it puts a lot of pressure on these specialists by families and sick people, uh, and they become known as the cannabis doctors. So you have to spread it, for, for example, among many physicians and many specialists. Uh, they allow to prescribe morphine, uh, morphine, so why not cannabis? There must be better quality control in real time before the medical cannabis reaches the patients. Grow under GMP, good manufacturing practice and the guidelines for cannabis cultivation. And GAP, good agricultural practice. These are all standards that have to be incorporated slowly into the industry. Reduce THC levels and increase CBD levels. Have the national medical insurance companies pay for, pay for medical cannabis. Many, many patients, they, not only they are in, in, in physical crisis, they're also in financial crisis. They go into financial crisis. They stop going to work and their uh, you know, uh, income is, is dropping and so forth. So it has to be covered by the national medical insurance companies. Approve education for doctors, nurses, and patients. Prepare curriculum uh, that we talked about. Allowed for distribution through pharmacies and not just few minute limited locations. And increase government funding for medical cannabis research. <clears throat> so, it's very uh, convenient for many governments says, oh, I'm not going to establish a medical cannabis agency. I'm going to import the buzzword. I'm going to import the medical cannabis from Holland, okay? Because Holland is the only country that exports medical cannabis. The truth of the matter is that there were two uh, growers in the Netherlands. One of them went bankrupt because uh, it is very expensive and the quality is not so satisfactory. And from the peak of 15,000 uh, growers, uh, 50,000 patients, uh, before they established the medical cannabis, there are less than 1,000. There's another pioneer here, a Dutch pioneer sitting in the room, who started the medical cannabis program in the Netherlands before the establishment of the uh, national agency. Can I say your name, please? <laughs> His name is uh, Marcel de Witt. <laughs> Uh, for Mari Farm, uh, and he sold to over 500 pharmacies in the Netherlands, uh, and he had good strains. And when the government established the agency, they did the tender, and they chose two other growers, unfortunately, and they used not such a good uh, strains. So uh, over uh, uh, over emphasis on security in the medical cannabis. Uh, because they say, oh, if we grow it in this country, uh, then it would leak it to the black market. The black market all over the world also in, almost is saturated with cannabis. The black market doesn't need medical cannabis to be a supplier to the black market. The black market is doing fine. Prohibition takes care of the black market. Okay? 
uh, it means higher prices, more people can grow themselves, and so, and so on. So there are many, the government are saying, we're going to import it. But the truth is, the Dutch don't produce that much, and they sell it at extremely high prices. A German patient, if he has to import it from the Netherlands, uh, from the Netherlands, he's paying 18 euros a gram, okay, for one gram. You can produce the, uh, the cannabis here in the Czech Republic very, very cheaply, okay, and provide it cheaply to the, to the patients. You don't have to import it from the, uh, from the Netherlands. This is a price list of uh, what uh, medical cannabis uh, is, is costing. In the United States, you can see on the left, 10 to 21 dollars uh, a gram. Yeah, average uh, is 17 dollars per gram, which is also, you know, if we look at 30 grams, it's uh, 30, uh, 300 to 600 dollars. Canada was, I don't know what it is today, 400, uh, 4.6 dollar gram. So Canada is pretty cheap, was. Uh, now now they, they, they are reshuffling the whole medical cannabis program in Canada now. They are issuing a tender uh, and are choosing the 180 new growers in Canada. Okay? In Holland, you can see uh, different varieties. Uh, so basically, uh, Bedrocan costs uh, ten dollars uh, a gram in the Netherlands. If you uh, export it to other countries, including the Czech Republic, it costs twenty-three uh, dollars a gram. That's in dollars. <clears throat> in Israel, uh, three point three dollars a gram. Okay. In Israel, the patient pays a hundred dollars a month, regardless of his amount, between thirty to hundred dollars. Now, if you go into these medications, Sativax. The government is saying, ah, why grow? We have Sativax, 50% CBD, 50% uh, THC. Sativax per month, that is the price. Okay? How many people can afford such a um, such price? Marinol, which was the first, there was synthetic Marinol first, and then was a, a, a natural extraction type of uh, from THC, cost also an arm and a leg, as I say. So the option of self-production have to be on the table to supply the patients with cheap enough uh, flowers. As I told you, in 2001, the Dutch were the first country to establish the medical cannabis on the industry. Before that, as I mentioned, Marcel David, uh, sold to over, I, I thought it was, uh, I may have said, over 1,000 pharmacies, serving 15,000 patients. They issued a tender, they chose two companies uh, due to restrictions on the number of strains. Bedrocan is the only one, has only four strains now, maybe five now. Bed selection, excessive price. Many patients stopped buying the medical cannabis and they purchased, they purchased, purchased it in coffee shops. Today there are less patients in the Netherlands uh, and uh, a horty farm uh, went bankrupt and what I want to say is if you start a medical cannabis program in the Czech Republic you, must, you, may, you have to make sure that among all the growers selected there is diversity of strains, St yeah, not only diversity, different types of strains because one strain works on one individual, it doesn't work on another individual. When a patient comes to you, give them three strains. You start with three strains and oil and, and browns. Take it home, see how you feel about this one, see how you feel about that one. Come back, tell me which one works better for the pain, better for the sleep, better for the uh, appetite and so on. So the number of strains is critical for the success of the, uh, of the national medical uh, cannabis uh, uh, program. So this is a couple of slides about working with authorities. Uh, their addiction to the, the authorities are addicted to the status quo. Until they move, it takes them years. In the meantime, people suffer because of their uh, addiction to status quo. 
they are not impressed by the facts, truth, or acts of compassion. There's so much science to back medical cannabis now. Yes, it cannot be ignored. For a long time they said, ah, there's not enough research. You know why there wasn't enough research? For a very long time, because the US government, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, didn't allow any researcher to have his own, uh, uh, his own uh, supply uh, for medical cannabis. Okay, so what happened? Israel has become uh, a superpower in medical cannabis research, not as a default, but you know, uh, but if uh, cannabis research was, uh, w would have been allowed in the United States, the United States would have been the superpowers uh, of medical cannabis as well, because that's where the money is. But the National Institute of Drug Abuse and its executive director, Noah Volkov, who was recently in Israel, that uh, when I said, what about the kind of medical cannabis research in the United States? Why are you killing it? She says the role of the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the United States is to find what's wrong with drugs, not what's good with drugs. I gave her a letter from veteran, administra from veteran organizations, yeah, American War Veteran Administrations. She was in Jerusalem. I approached her. I said, you have three letters from three veteran American War Veteran Organizations calling for your resignation. She became white, you know, I mean, uh, not often <laughs> people come to her, give her. <laughs> she's, uh, by the way, she's the, uh, she's the uh, granddaughter of uh, Trotsky, this lady, Noah Volkov, yeah, the head of NIDA. Anyhow, back to the authorities, talk, to the, talk, talk the language they know, point to their country, how their politicians' interests are served, how the country's interests are safe, are, is served. You know how the country's in, uh, uh, interests are, are served? When you have a national medical cannabis program, not only people are, are helped, not, uh, not only it's an act of compassion by the government, but it also saves money for the government, for the Ministry of Health. You know why? Because you, when you take all these patients with these expensive medications, you have to pay for the pharmaceutical companies in, the, in, in the Holland, <clears throat> I'm sorry, not in Holland, in the EU, in the United States, which cost hundred, hundreds of dollars a month. When you give them cannabis, suddenly they reduce the number of, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of drugs, they, of, 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 of pharmaceuticals they take from other sources. You have to work with authorities. You have to uh, uh, continue with dialogue, be brief, prepare a book of abstract, show them that it's well researched now, safe and effective medicine. They don't like to be proactive, the politicians. You be proactive. The activists, you have to be proactive. Lay down a plan how to proceed from here, how it will save money for the authorities. Talk how, tell them that it's not, they're not going to be the first country that has such a program. Like I said, they don't have to invent the wheels. There are three countries and 17, now there are 20 states in the United States. So they should give them confidence to move ahead. Organize patients. Patients organizations are very, have a very important role in the process of pushing governments to launch medical cannabis uh, a program. The Cancer Patient Association, the Multiple Sclerosis Association, they should go to the government and say, hey, in other countries people get medical cannabis. Why don't you get your act together? Make demonstrations, make them feel bad, make them look evil. Because not giving medical cannabis to patients an excess, that's an evil thing to do, that's an immoral thing to do, especially with what we know today. Now, as an activist, I have to tell you, you know, I mean, be prepared to pay personal cost. You may be hustled by the, uh, by the police, or you may be perceived as a, uh, you know, a pro-drug guy or whatever. I mean, if eventually you win, you know, you can uh, be considered a hero. I mean, don't hold your breath, as they say. I mean, you can either end up in jail, I don't know, in some countries, or become a hero. As Martin Luther King once said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then, uh, 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 then they take you into consideration, and then you win, okay? So the first part, first they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, is the part that is most dominant or the... Uh, is, uh, has, has the long, longer time in, in, all, in every activist's work. Build media. Many, many people in the media smoke cannabis, okay? And they feel very bad when, uh, they, feel very bad when they are, uh, feel hypocrites to give negative. Uh, so usually the media is the most progressive part in society 
integrate them into uh, give testimonials of patients put it on YouTube okay uh, and so on these are the ten common reasons why why governments don't uh, launch medical cannabis programs it has it's all lies it has no medical value of course it does have medical value uh, there's not enough research of course there's enough research today conventional treatments are not good enough cannabis is less addictive it is as addictive as coffee there's no medicine has been approved in the form of smoking that's maybe true but there's no uh, patch when they invented the patch there was no medicine that was before they invented the patch that was used for you know as a patch so that's not if, if smoking works then use the smoking it's prohibited by UN drug conventions it's not prohibited by UN drug conventions UN drug conventions allow the medical use of prohibited drugs yes I, I can show you I don't know how much time do we have uh, I think maybe 15 minutes 15 minutes all right the police and the public is against it I don't know you know I mean uh, if you make survey in countries uh, in the United States 80 percent 90 percent of people are for medical cannabis I'm sure it's true here why resist something that is good the public usually supports medical cannabis it's a cover for cannabis legalization it's not a uh, cover for cannabis legalization it is an, an attempt to offer sick people a medication if it was basilicum instead of medical cannabis there would be a, a, a basilicum movement to give it to people I mean of course a basilicum is, is legal but this turned out to be a wonder this wonder plant is illegal so it's a much harder struggle during the time of recession the government cannot fund such program there are ways that the patients will cover the cost or the or other ways to do it this is what a guy by the name of dr. William Scholten William Scholten was the head of the Dutch Medical Cannabis Bureau for many years he was then because he has be, he went went to the World Health Organization in a condi in a position access of controlled head of team access to control medication Department of Essential Men World Health Organizations ladies and gentlemen this guy is like up there and this is the chart that he said that medical cannabis could be accessed by the best way to offer medical cannabis to patients is without any doubt a professional production respecting all pharmaceutical quality requirements like for any other medicine in parentheses warranting a constant strength and absence of heavy metals pesticides and microbiological contamination and the distribution through pharmacies this is the model the single convention of the UN requires a government monopoly if the government wants to produce inside the country but import is simpler because it can be done without such monopoly and government involvement okay these guidelines do not recommend any exceptional position of control medicine. so what happens what could what could happen here or in, in other countries is that the first four or five or six countries will be medical cannabis exporting countries because it will export to other countries who say ah why bother I can import it from Israel I can be imported from the Czech Republic I can import it so the first you know half a dozen or a dozen countries will be these the exporting countries to the rest of the world And there's a serious problem in the world and it's a very sad uh, story that I'm about to tell you in the last 10 minutes of my presentation I know it's uh, a lot of information this is a uh, paper by the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime it's called ensuring availability of controlled medications control medications are all these illegal drugs for the relief of pain and prevention of diversion and abuse other words striking the right balance to achieve the optimal public health outcome this is a 2011 United Nations in the office of uh, drug control in Vienna this is like this is where it's it 
they decide on new and drug conventions, these people. And what basically they're saying is that there isn't enough pain medication in the world. Governments have failed the people to provide them with pain medications. Okay? And they say this. The tragedy, the tragedy of the inadequate availability of opiate analgesics. Opiate analgesics, this is anything that is produced from the opium plant, the morphine, the oxycontin, and it's a whole list. There are maybe 20, 30 med different medications and analogs from opium, uh, synthetic opium as well. Although medical science has capacity to provide relief for most forms of moderate and severe pain, over 80% of the world population still uh, will have insufficient analgesia or no analgesia at all if they suffer from such pain. The WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates that each year 5.5 million people terminal patient cancer and 1 million HIV and uh, cancer patients, including 800,000 patients with lethal injuries by accidents and 110 million women in labor giving birth don't have access to pain medications. And you know why? The truth about morphine availability, according to a 2005 estimate, six countries, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, United Kingdom, and the United States, consume 80% of the world morphine. Only 20% is left for the rest of the world. The less affluent, the less affluent countries of the world population consume only 6% of the global morphine supply. Some countries have basically no access to morphine and other forms of supplies. Experts in pain management attribute the underdistribution of morphine to the unwarranted fear of the drug potential for addiction and abuse, meaning the UN, with its global influence, is saying to the countries, you know, you cannot have access, uh, don't start with uh, uh, morphine and other analgesia because it's uh, dangerous that it will reach the black market. The number one drug problem in the United States today, it's not heroin, it's not cocaine, it is uh, uh, pain medications, okay? There are more opiate-related pain medication addicts in the United States today than heroin and cocaine combined, okay? And then it goes on. There's a company called Malin Codet. I, I, hope, I hope I'm saying it right. Opium for medicinal use is produced today in India, Turkey, and Australia. 2,000, this is from the website, 2,000 tons of opium are produced annually, and this supplies the world with the raw material needed to make medicinal products. Of course it doesn't supply the world, it supplies the United States and these five other countries that we talked about. Okay? Now, I don't want to go into this uh, uh, too much uh, anymore, but the bottom line is that medical cannabis, okay, medical cannabis is a wonderful option to provide pain medication for those countries who don't have access to opiates. It is a moral crime of governments who are not offering their sick and dying people and the suffering medical cannabis as a substitute or as another option to opiates that these populace, these people uh, don't have access to. And one of the reasons is that the, that the governments and the pharmaceutical industry is, is, is trying to develop synthetic or, uh, cannabinoids. And, uh, and other forms of extracts is, this is from the patent of the guy who extracted uh, synthetic THC initially, and then it was too expensive, and then he tried to do uh, extraction from uh, the cannabis plant. 
He says the consequence of this, of extracting cannabis from an uh, organic source into a pill, okay? That is the motive that he had. The consequence of this would be the availability of alternative therapies involving THC, yeah, in the form of pill, which would help suppressing the public outcry for approval of marijuana as medicine. What this basically means is that scientists are collaborating with the governments to suppress access of, the, of, the, of, of nations to the flower. If they are trying to, pharm pharma to, uh, to make cannabis a pharmaceutical agent that they can patent and make money, you cannot patent the flower, okay? The reason it took so long is that you could not patent the medical cannabis. And the pharmaceutical industry is now rushing into cannabis worldwide, trying to extract different cannabinoids. And here on this stage, and not only me, people are saying it's not gonna work. Cannabis, access to cannabis flower is a holistic, as a holistic medicine must be maintained, and it should be an option for pain and for all other uh, indications that I mentioned before. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, I think we got uh, two minutes or less or what? Máme pár minut na otázky, takže jestli vás někoho uh, něco zajímá, tak se určitě přihlašte. Yes. Hello, I wasn't here from from beginning. Uh, I was. Uh, I want to ask if uh, there is a possibility to get to some sources uh, in. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in um, medical cannabis. I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to say it uh, again? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is, the, is, uh, is there some way how I can get to, to, to some uh, sources? Uh, how, uh, how is uh, the cannabis in the medical way used in uh, Israel for medication for the patients which are, which are uh, cured uh, on cancer, sickness? You have to, uh, your oncologist, your oncologist, your doctor, your specialist, First, unfortunately, they give you all these biological treatments and chemotherapy and this and that. And if you, uh, as a last resort, they would give you medical cannabis. We now, to help with the pain and with the, uh, all the other symptoms of, of the medications and the disease itself, we now know also that CBD and THC are anti-cancerous in their own right, not just as a uh, adjunct to, uh, to other medications, but it has anti-cancerous. So go to your doctor, yes, and, and ask, for, I don't know how it is in this country, but uh, there must be leadership. And I understand, I know a few Czech activists who are leading the effort and here in the Czech Republic, it's relatively advanced compared to other countries, compared to France, compared to Germany, and to other countries that uh, I see the authorities are resisting uh, moving forward uh, to provide access to uh, medical cannabis. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, I have a, uh, an addition to your reply. My name is Ilya Reznik, and I am a medical cannabis specialist from Israel. So uh, also I'm here as a representative of International Association of Medical Cannabis, which is the only one internationally recognized association of the doctors in the world. So we contain some educational levels. I do not suppose that uh, doctors, medical doctors in Czech Republic and other countries could provide you good uh, good answers on this matter because they sh simply do not educate it on this way. Uh, we have some resources. Uh, tomorrow I have a lecture and I will provide you the concise, the list of the very reliable sources for information. You could uh, free access these uh, websites of our association 
and uh, other associations and uh, take from there any uh, relevant material for cancer, for glaucoma and other medical conditions in order to provide you, you will provide uh, more education to your doctors than they will provide you knowledge on this. Thank you. Dámy a pánové, bohužel už nemáme moc času na další otázky, takže to byl Pás Vachtel z Izraela. Děkuji